Welcome to the Miko Paled podcast. This episode is going to be part two of the Q&A that we did with Miko's listeners. So there's a few more questions here that we wanted to broadcast out to you all. And let's get right to it. This next question is from Diab, and the question is, is there a reason that there hasn't been a single Arab army attacking Israel since 1973? Is it because the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Egypt would counterattack them? Well, um, a little bit of presumption in that question, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, well, first, first of all, the, Israel has made, made sure from its very establishment that it was going to have the strongest military um, and it would never allow itself to be attacked. And so Israel really, except for 1973, uh, the War of October 1973, Israel was never attacked. Israel has always initiated every single war um, when, when, when it felt like initiating the war. So it always did it when conditions were right for Israel, which is why it always had these spectacular victories. They were fighting states that had no significant military force. Um, and so... 1973, you know, the Syrians and the Egyptians attacked. That was the only time they caught Israel off guard. They beat Israel quite heavily, quite badly. Israel recovered, but it was hit quite badly. Thousands of casualties, thousands of, you know, POWs. I mean, it was a real humiliation. You know, in late 1970s, the, the largest Arab country and the most significant in terms of military power, at least at that time, made peace with Israel. Uh, then after that, Jordan made peace with Israel. So they have reverted their, diverted their resources to other things. But I think it's, I think the main, the, the, the main uh, issue here is that Israel has always made sure that it has the strongest, biggest, and most uh, brutal military force and the most aggressive policies. So it's always the one that's being more, that's, that, that's controlling the aggression, that is, ma- that is maintaining and projecting the aggression. And uh, it's got the, the intelligence services that are invasive and violent and, 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 and follow really no rule whatsoever and, and, and no, no, no law whatsoever. So that's why, I mean, a, a military campaign against Israel uh, would, I think, justifiably be deemed uh, suicidal. I will say, though, that Hezbollah showed that the Israeli army is not invincible in terms of, at least in terms of ground forces. So in 2006, when Israel invaded southern Lebanon, the Israeli ground forces were beaten badly and they ran back home with their tails between their legs um, because they are not as well motivated, they're not as well trained uh, as Hezbollah forces were. Um, But again, Israel has air power and so was able to decimate southern Lebanon and create a million refugees within that very short, relatively short uh, incursion. Um, and it will, it will never, it will, it will not be shy to go in and bomb and destroy and, 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 and kill innocent civilians at any time it feels that um, it can get away with it. And that is, and that is a deterrent, really, that is a deterrent. All right, next question is from, uh, uh, apologies if I'm pronouncing this name wrong, Pequin. How long... How do, I'm sorry, how does Israel get away with its barbaric treatment of Palestinians in and out of prisons, their theft of land for illegal settlements, and its total disregard of international law? How? Well, that's an excellent question. I think Israel gets away with it because the world doesn't care. Uh, the world doesn't care about Arabs being killed. The world doesn't care about uh, Palestinian children being uh, tortured and jailed in prisons. By and large, the world, the world does not care. Israel has created over the last hundred years an incredible PR system uh, that works in every every country imaginable uh, to promote its ideas, to um, work within the political systems, to work with journalists, to work with opinion makers, so that it always is able to be, it is always portrayed as the good guy. It's always portrayed as the, uh, the Jews fighting injustice or fighting evil and so on. And also it's created a reality where it's worthwhile for a lot of countries to work with Israel and it's not worthwhile for them to oppose Israel, either for political or economic reasons. 
So that's how it gets away with it. It gets away with it because the voice of people like ours who care, who believe in justice, are not long, are not are not um, uh, are not loud enough. We need to make uh, we need to work harder. We need to do more so that the fact that people do care about Palestinians and the people who do care about Palestinians, their voices are amplified and reach a point where they actually have political influence. Until we're able to influence politics in our different countries, it's not going to change. So Israel gets away with it because Israel does a very good job at making sure it can get away with it. Um, they've got people on the ground in every country, in every capital, in every major newspaper, making sure that their story is told and heard in the way that is favorable to them. And until we're able to match that, I'm afraid that our voices are not going to be uh, as loud. The next one is from uh, Arif. Hi, Miko. What is your solution to ending the apartheid in the Holy Land? And how would you convince your fellow Israeli Jews to willingly change as de Klerk did in South Africa all those years ago? Well, that's a great question, and I'll start with the end. De Klerk was not convinced. De Klerk was forced. Whites in South Africa were not convinced one day to end apartheid. It's not like they woke up one day and they said, you know what, all this apartheid business, all this injustice is really wrong. That's not what happened. And the lesson, and that's precisely the lesson we need to learn and apply, and of course is being applied, uh, to Palestine. The Republic of South Africa was a pariah state. They could not participate in any sporting event, cultural event, uh, political event, uh, uh, academic, uh, academic uh, conferences. The apartheid uh, South Africa or the Republic of South Africa was banned from everything. They could not go anywhere. They could not play football. They could not play rugby. They could not. They were not in the Olympics. They were not anywhere. They were not allowed anywhere near. And you were and you were penalized if you invited them. It was that severe that if you, a country invited a South African delegation, the country would be penalized. Um, there are no such thing as, as ambassadors to most countries. Uh, boycott, divestment, sanctions. It's, a, it's an incredibly difficult uh, campaign, an incredibly diff difficult and slow form of, um, of resistance, but it worked. You know, I was in South Africa, and in South Africa, by the way, BDS South Africa, is incredibly power, incredibly strong, incredibly influential. The, the government of South Africa has uh, embraced it and, so, and supports it and has, uh, has downgraded its uh, di diplomatic mission in, in Tel Aviv. They no longer have an ambassador in Tel Aviv. Um, and so they, they know they, this is what they say. This is what works in South Africa. And therefore, we need to all work hard and support Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions, BDS, for Palestine, for free Palestine. Um, and then Israeli society and Israeli politicians, out of, out of a lack of, of, of options, will bring about the change, will allow the change to occur. So de Klerk did not wake up one morning feeling good. De Klerk and the entire uh, white South Africa realized they were on their knees. They had nowhere to go. It was done. It was over. It was finished. You know, and this is from going from controlling all of Southern Africa, which is an enormous amount of land and enormous resources with gold and uranium and, 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 uh, and nuclear weapons to being brought down to their knees. Uh, and that's when de Klerk stood up as president of South Africa and declared the, that Nelson Mandela and the other prisoners will be freed, that all the political parties would be allowed to run. They unbanned all the political parties that were banned from running, and they called for a one-person, one-vote election. That is the end of apartheid, and that is how uh, the end of apartheid will take place in Palestine. Now, it could happen sooner or it can happen later. That all depends on us. That all depends on how hard we work. That all depends on how fast we work. That all depends how well we organize. That all depends how much we talk to our neighbors and our families. Uh, and, and so forth, uh, and get them and get them to organize and get involved. It all depends on how effective we are talking to our elected politicians or unelected politicians in countries where politicians are not elected. Um, but make sure that we uh, use as much our influence to make sure that they know what we demand and that we demand an end to diplomatic relations with Israel, an end to Israeli participation in the Olympics, an end to Israeli participation in the World Cup, an end to Israeli participation 
and cultural and, and, and academic um, uh, events and, and, and so forth and conferences. And that's when this will happen. But the, but again, the, the clerk was not convinced. The whites in South Africa were not convinced. They were brought down to their knees and then they got up the next day and they realized, well, this is a new reality here. And guess what? They had Nelson Mandela for president. So that couldn't have been too bad. All right. This next question is anonymous as well. Why do you support Palestine while everyone is having relationships with Israel? I think the question should be why are people why do people have relations with Israel when they should be supporting Palestine? I think that's that's the that's the real question. I don't understand people who support Israel. I don't need to just understand people who uh, who support a state that is engaged in terrorism and violence and racism and and uh, imposed an apartheid regime on 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 another people. So to me, it's perfectly natural to support Palestine and, and justice and freedom in Palestine and the people of Palestine. Uh, what seems strange to me is people who don't, is people who continue relations with Israel, who promote Israeli ideas, who are willing to work with Israel, um, even though, again, Israel has been engaged in horrific, horrific uh, crimes against humanity, like genocide and ethnic cleansing and, again, apartheid. Uh, to me, that is the bigger question. All right. This next question is also anonymous, and this is, what are your thoughts on the current forms of Palestinian resistance? Do you think the Palestinians have the right to use violence as their means to achieve their ends? You know, that's a really good and, and uh, important question. I've never been oppressed. I've never lived under occupation. I've never uh, had my family members killed or imprisoned. I was never dragged into prison myself as a, you know, or beaten or tortured. So I don't know what to say. I mean, I don't know what form of resistance is right or wrong because I've never been oppressed. Um, it would be very easy uh, to sit in somewhere very comfortable to live a privileged life and to preach to oppressed people how they need to respond to the oppression that they experience. Um, but I think that would be wrong. It's, it's, uh, oppression is not an academic uh, experiment. Resistance is not a theoretical idea. It is a real thing. Oppression, the Palestinians uh, experience every moment of every hour of every day of every year of their life is real, is horrifying. When your child is being detained and, and tortured in, in a prison cell and you can't reach them. When your child is going to die of a curable disease because Israel won't allow it access to a hospital and to medi uh, medical care. When you don't have water and, and basic most medicine to give your children. I don't know what that's like, but I know it's real. And I know that anybody who chooses to stand up and fight this injustice and resist has a right to do so. And what means they choose and what means they believe are the right means for them are the right means for them. I think that should be categorically, uh, I categorically reject the notion that anybody but Palestinians have a right to determine what kind of resistance Palestinians engage. And also, I categorically uh, reject the notion that Palestinians are now or ever have been engaged in terrorism. I think that uh, the struggle for freedom and justice is a perfectly legitimate um, struggle. And according to international law, it is a legitimate struggle even using the use of arms. So even in terms of law, it is not, uh, there's no room to criticize it. But I believe uh, that Palestinians need to use whatever uh, resistance they feel is, is most effective. At the same time, I'll say that if we look historically at Palestinian resistance, we will see that the most effective form of resistance uh, so far and by far has been uh, the, the BDS call, the call for boycott, divestment and sanctions. I think it's got the most potential. I think it's um, the least dangerous to Palestinians. And I think it has the, the ability to bring about real change. Uh, and Israel has absolutely no way and doesn't have the means. No country really has the means um, to fight it. All right. The next question is another three-parter, so uh, we'll tackle each one individually. First, thank you for who you are. 
How do you see Arab youth and Israeli youth who are fed up with occupation building bridges without compromising, boycotting Israel? Um, well, say, well, you're welcome, and thank you for the comment and the question. I, I don't see that happening. I mean, Israeli youth do not oppose the occupation by and large. Israeli youth participate in the occupation by and large. Uh, they're the ones who put on a uniform and man the checkpoints and uh, and and execute the incursions and and drop the bombs and uh, shoot the and, and drive the tanks and and shoot the missiles. Um, so I don't see I don't see Israeli youth as 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 um, as a source of hope right now. I think that when Palestine is free, after apartheid has fallen and we've had a one person one vote election. And Israelis will wake up in the morning and they will have a Palestinian prime minister and they're going to go to kids are going to go to school with Palestinian kids. Uh, that's when Israeli and Palestinian kids will work together to bring about a better understanding and a building of something new from these two societies that have been forced to live in, um, in as, as two segregated societies. Uh, but until until the struggle ends and, and, and succeeds, I should say, I don't see that happening at all. All right, second part of that question is, do you see a one-state solution feasible anytime soon? If not, is the two-state solution still viable? That's a great question. Um, the one state is not an option of several uh, solutions. The one state is a reality. Uh, two states is an impossibility, and the one state is a reality. There's a single state in Palestine. It is the state of Israel, it's an apartheid regime. It keeps Israelis and Palestinians segregated, completely segregated. It has uh, Israelis living under one set of laws and Palestinians living under different sets of laws depending on where they reside exactly. So it's a complicated kind of bureaucracy and it's a complicated legal system under which Palestinians live. It is, a it, it is an extremely brutal state. It exercises violence um, and has absolutely no regard for the lives of Palestinians, for the well-being of Palestinians, even children. Um, it's a state that keeps two million Palestinians locked up in prison in the Gaza Strip with no access to clean water, no access to proper medical care. Even now, with uh, this terrible virus that is that is spreading like wildfire, even now Israel is not um, is, is, is not is not allowing the Palestinians what it needs in order to fight this and, and, and prevent uh, spreading of this disease. So it is one state. This one state is a reality. It's not an option. What is an option is whether or not this state continues to exist as an apartheid, violent, racist regime or is replaced by a real democracy with equal rights, which will mean a free Palestine. So the options that we have as people of conscience, as people who would like to act uh, and, and bring about justice is not one state, two states. It's a one state that is what we see today. And people who support Israel need to realize they're supporting racism and violence and, and crimes against humanity. Or we believe in a free Palestine, in which case we need to reject Israel, reject Zionism, and fight. And I believe, again, using boycott, divestment, and sanctions is the most potent and powerful tool that we have uh, to use that to bring down the regime and um, and free Palestine and, and, and allow for this one state to, to be changed from a an apartheid to a real democracy with equal rights. All right, and the last part, what is the ideal position for each of the following countries, in your opinion, going forward to end the occupation, considering all treaties are signed? So he's asking this question about, or they, I'm sorry, this person is asking this question about three countries, Jordan, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia. Well, it's not about any of those countries whatsoever. I mean, these countries are neighboring countries, and you know, of course, you know, ideally everybody will live in peace. Uh, Jordan and Egypt, sadly, still have diplomatic relations with Israel. Um, I would prefer to see those diplomatic relations ending. Uh, I, I think, uh, but but that's not only only those countries. I think all countries should end their diplomatic relations with Israel as a form uh, of of supporting the Palestinian resistance and fighting and rejecting Zionism. Um, so I don't think these particular Arab countries are any different than any other country around the world. They support and they work with Israel, and I believe that all countries should stop working with Israel and should not support the state of Israel. Um, and in fact, reject it and 
bring to a point where we can see the state of Israel as a regime collapse and be uh, replaced with a real democracy with equal rights. But I don't think those countries have any different role than any other country around the world. All right. Two more questions. Do you see justice being served and Palestine being free? If I didn't see that, I wouldn't be doing what I do. I mean, I think it'd be stupid to get up in the morning and put all your time and all your effort into something you don't believe is going to happen. So if I didn't believe in every bone and every cell in my body uh, and every breath that I take, that this is not only possible, but inevitable and achievable, then I wouldn't be doing what I do. So I, I invite everybody to, to, you know, to, to, to get with that, get with the program and, and get with this belief and, and get with this idea that a free Palestine is within our grasp. A free Palestine is within our reach. But it's up to us. It's not going to come. It's not going to be, you know, it's not going to come from the heavens. It is up to us to fight, to organize, to, to boycott, to demand, to make sure our politicians know what we demand, to stand by our demands, to work together uh, with other groups uh, who fight for other causes. Um, then we will see the, you know, we will see this, uh, this struggle succeed. All right, and uh, this last question is from myself because uh, I'm not quite sure where you stand on this. So there's been a lot made, especially from American, Palestinian, and Palestinian advocacy voices around Bernie Sanders' campaign and how it crosses with broader campaign for and, and, and social justice efforts for a free Palestine, especially as it relates to how the U.S. is entangled in everything. What's, what's just your general thoughts about um, a lot of the rallying, Palestinian voice rallying around Bernie Sanders on this particular issue? Like, what, what do you see as promising or good or legitimate? And what do you see as maybe, you know, not, you know, some, do you see any sort of flaws in that? Like, can you speak very, very frankly and honestly about the Bernie Sanders campaign as it pertains to Palestinian justice? So uh, I think that's an incredibly important question. Bernie Sanders has broken some barriers that no major politician has ever broken. You know, he was, he's a major contender, and has been for a long time, a major contender for the presidency. And in a debate where it was him and Hillary Clinton, so this is the stakes of, couldn't get any higher. He stood up and he criticized Israel for bombing Gaza and for, uh, you know, killing and, and injuring thousands of people. No one, no one, no one has ever done that. No major politician that really cares about his career, his or her career, has ever done that. That is huge. To dare to stand up as a major candidate and criticize Israel for bombing Gaza is unheard of. And he did it, and that didn't hurt his, 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 his campaign at all. Later on, he stood up and he said that the U.S. needs to condition aid, condition aid to Israel, which you'd think, why not, right? But has never been said, has never been suggested, is, is you know, politicians, excuse me, will run the other way before they even dare to say that. He said that the U.S. needs to condition its aid to Israel, on Israel's uh, willingness to make peace and then so forth and allow Palestinian rights. And he said some of that can go to help rebuild Gaza. So he's broken some barriers. He's, he's, he's broken the ceiling that nobody, nobody ever thought would be possible. Now, I credit that, I give credit to Students for Justice in Palestine, the different peace groups uh, you know, around the country, uh, the different pro-Palestinian groups around the country, Adalai and, and the Palestinian uh, campaign, and so on and so on. All these different groups that are doing really good work uh, on the ground, grassroots work. Probably, I, I'd say SJP on campuses are, 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 are they're my favorite. I think they do the, the, the most important, they've done the most important work. Uh, and they get, they, they pay a heavy price. I credit all of them for, you know, for ha us having seen Bernie Sanders do that. That would never have happened if they didn't do this work. So he's broken barriers and he said things that no American politicians would ever dare to say and still won't dare say. 
he's still the only lo- the lo- the lone voice saying that and many other things. You know, I mean, his 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 whole response to the COVID nine issue now to to healthcare and so forth, I think is 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 excellent. Um, but he's there to say this, which nobody thought a major politician would ever say. Now, at the same time, he declares himself to be a supporter of Israel. He prides himself that when he was young, he volunteered on a kibbutz, which I think is a terrible thing. He prefaces everything by saying, I love Israel, I support Israel, I'm proud of being Jewish. That has got to stop. He does not accept and does not, will not uh, support BDS. He must support BDS. So he's done some incredible things, and I think um, he should be applauded, And but we shouldn't stop and, and just say this is great. We need to push him forward. He's got to be pushed, and I believe he can be pushed. And I know some excellent activists, Palestinian activists, who are working very close with him to try to push him in that direction, to be more clear about his support for Palestine and to start rejecting Israel and rejecting Zionism. He has got to reject Zionism. And I believe that if he doesn't do it, I mean, granted, I can't. I don't imagine him running again. He doesn't make it this time. It's hard to imagine him running again when he's 80 something. But I think this is, he's open, he's, he's, him having broken these barriers is going to make it easier for somebody in the next campaign to come up and to get closer to where we want, which is supporting, uh, maybe not even rejecting Zionism, but accepting BDS and supporting boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And I'll tell you a funny little anecdote. After um, uh, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar won their, their election, you know, the last uh, congressional uh, camp election, um, many of us went there and congratulated them and so forth. And I was sitting with some friends inside Ilhan Omar's office. And there were a lot of people there. And suddenly the door opens and he walks in, Bernie Sanders. And I'm sitting there with my suit, my big BDS button, which I failed to wear today. But the big BDS button. And everybody's on their phone, so nobody paid attention. I happened to look up and I said, oh, it's Bernie Sanders. He's Bernie's here. So, of course, everybody stands up, wants to take pictures, and I stood up as well. He saw my button, which is quite big. He turned around and sped the other way. So <laughs> I, was, I was with a mutual friend of ours, uh, you and I, and I said, I'm getting a picture with this man with, with the button. Anyway, we, we managed to outmaneuver him. After all, he's 75. I'm a little bit younger. Managed to, you know, dead end him. And I stood next to him, gave him my book, and we took a picture. So I have a picture with him. He wasn't happy about it. Uh, but I managed to chat with him about a Palestinian friend of mine, Issa Amra, who we met and so forth. Fine. And I, and I think it's a good picture because he's not happy. And he, the reason he wasn't keen about having the picture taken is because of the BDS button. There's no question about that. And it's very prominent. You can't not see it. Um, he needs to be pushed on this issue. He needs to be pushed on this issue. And I think he can be pushed. I think we can get a Bernie Sanders to, if not reject Israel, as maybe you and I would, then at least to stand up and say, yes, boycotting, imposing sanctions is the right thing. And uh, it's not that hard. I mean, my dad, who, who you know, was rejected the occupation of 1967, but was a, was a, was a, was a you know, very strong Zionist, in 1992, way before BDS, he called on the United States to impose sanctions on Israel. So in other words, it's not that you, it's not that outrageous, you know, if a former general uh, and a Zionist could call on the United States and other countries to impose sanctions on Israel because of its treatment of Palestinians, then certainly a progressive like Bernie Sanders can do it. So again, I think he's done incredible things and he's broken some important barriers, but I don't think we need to sit on our laurels. I think we have a lot of work to do to get him. And if not him, then the next guy or woman, whoever it's going to be, to take the stance that should be taken, which is rejecting Zionism and supporting boycott. Yeah, I agree. I think he's planted an important flag and it's going to take it's going to take activists on the ground to be able to push um, those the next successor to the Bernie movement like in, into that direction. All right, that is all of our questions. We got through everything. Um, there might have been some more questions that rolled through in the last day or so. I tried to check this right before. So um, any of those questions, I'm going to roll over into any future episodes. Again, please send us your questions. Booking at MikoPaled.com. That's B-O-O-K-I-N-G. 
And that'll do it. Miko, you have anything you want to go out on? Any closing statements? Oh, Shout outs? Appreciate people, uh, you know, uh, sending these questions, listening to the podcast. Um, remind people to check uh, PCRF.net. Like I said, I'll schedule a, a, a podcast with uh, Steve Sosabi, who is the head of the PCRF, so you can hear directly from him. Um, and I asked the people at the Ministry of Health in Gaza to send me updates, and so they're sending me updates um, about the situation there. So I'll be able to we'll be able to talk about that in in in, um, in the next few uh, podcasts that we have. Uh, but thank you, and thank everybody, and um, let's free Palestine. <laughs>